In addition to translation of classical writers, Anne Carson is greatly esteemed for her published poems, essays, libretti, prose criticism, and verse novels that often cross genres. Her inspiring cross-disciplinary approach is also the mission of T-Space. You can take a look at her amazing book, Knox. It's here. It's right inside uh, the glass enclosure uh, room there. Um, a Xerox quality reproduction of a notebook made after the death of her brother. The notebook contains text, photographs, letters, pasted in inkjet printouts, handwriting, paintings, and collage. Knox has no page numbers, it's accordion folded, and feels very much like a visual art multiple. Anne has been given many awards and honors, including the Lannan Literary Award, the Pushcart Prize, Griffin Poetry Prize, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the MacArthur Fellowship. Now Stephen's going to say a few words about Anne. I need the help of my fiance, Demetra Zagrelia, because there's some Greek in here. I was first introduced to Anne Carson's work by the director of Poets House, Lee Brissetti. When I called her, I was thinking of having, you know, spending the summer reading, and I wanted to read a poet that's writing today, because I have, we have a very large poetry collection here, but I wanted to re read someone that she thought who was the voice of today, and she said, you should read Ann Carson. And that was 1999, and I bought the autobiography of Red, and I was inspired by the fusion of a novel with poetry. And recently I was reading her book, Red Dock, which is uh, 2013, I think, and I came across this sentence, open, the heavens are perfect, Reflections, sounds, round. Good morning, good EO. And I was very excited because we have a daughter, five months old, <laughs> who we named EO, Helene. So there's a gun of Greek connection. The ancient Greeks fused poetry into texts. And I remember reading uh, more than once Homer's The Odyssey, and, and the sticking in my mind are two phrases the rosy fingers of dawn, which appears several times in the text, and the wine dark sea. And I thought, uh, Demetra could translate this into Greek, the rosy fingers of dawn. Rhododactyli io, in ancient Greek, and rhododactyli avgi, in Greek, modern the, the Greek. The rosy fingers of dawn yes. ends in io, right? Yes. Can you io. say it again? Rhododactyli io. <laughs> and then the wine dark sea. Inopus pondos, in ancient Greek, and, and uh, the wine red the wine the, dark sea. Yes, uh, the Melani Thalassa or Melano Pelagos. Yes. So it's it's a great pleasure to introduce Anne Carson here at Tuesday. Hello, Sirtes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming all. <laughs> it's it's okay. <laughs> I'm really, 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 really honored to be with Pat Steer anywhere, but especially here. And I'm going to read, because I think of the floating line as in the history of art as a trajectory going, as Stephen said, from Paleolithic times to Proust to Pat Steer, I'm going to read an essay on Proust. It fits in the middle there. <laughs> I wrote the essay on Proust because I had the experience, which many of you may have had, of reading Proust. I read it in French for half an hour every morning. It took six years. And when I was done, I realized um, the problem with reading Proust is that one day it ends. And then there's the world without Proust. And there's nothing else like Proust. So you go forward in life in a kind of, uh, well, Proust withdrawal. So in the condition of Proust withdrawal, I decided to write an essay about him which would prolong being with Proust for a little longer. So I wrote an essay on Albertine, who's the female heroine of his novel. And it's prose, I guess. It's written in 59 numbered paragraphs. And there are a few appendices at the end, which 
<coughs> of which I'll select a few of the most useful. It's called the Albertine Workout. One, Albertine, the name, is not a common name for a girl in France, although Albert is widespread for a boy. Two, Albertine's name occurs 2,363 times in Proust's novel, more than any other character. Three, Albertine herself is present or mentioned on 807 pages of Proust's novel. Four, on a good 19% of these pages, she is asleep. <laughs> Five, Albertine is believed by some critics, including André Gide, to be a disguised version of Proust's chauffeur, Alfred Agostinelli. This is called the transposition theory. Six, Albertine constitutes a romantic, psychosexual, and moral obsession for the narrator of the novel, mainly throughout volume five of Proust's seven volume in the Pleiad edition work. Seven, volume five is called La Prisonnière in French and The Captive in English. It was declared by Roger Shattuck, a world expert on Proust, in his award-winning 1974 study, to be the one volume of the novel that a time-pressed reader may safely and entirely skip. <laughs> Eight, the problems of Albertine are, from the narrator's point of view, A, lying, B, lesbianism. From Albertine's point of view, A, being imprisoned in the narrator's house. Nine, her bad taste in music, although several times remarked on, is not a problem. 10. Albertine does not call the narrator directly by his name anywhere in the novel, nor does anyone else. The narrator hints that his first name might be the same first name as that of the author of the novel, that is, Marcel. Let's go with that. 11. Albertine denies she is a lesbian when Marcel questions her. 12. Her friends are all lesbians. 13. Her denials fascinate him. 14. Her friends fascinate him too, especially by their contrast with his friends, who are gay but closeted. Her friends parade themselves at the beach and kiss in restaurants. 15. Despite intense and assiduous questioning, Marcel cannot discover what exactly it is that women do together this palpitating specificity of female pleasure, as he calls it. 16. Albertine says she does not know. 17. Once Albertine has been imprisoned by Marcel in his house, his feelings change. It was her freedom that first attracted him, the way the wind billowed in her garments. This attraction is now replaced by a feeling of ennui, boredom. She becomes, as he says, a heavy slave. 18. This is predictable, given Marcel's theory of desire, which equates possession of another person with erasure of the otherness of her mind, while at the same time positing otherness as what makes another person desirable. 19. And in point of fact, how can he possess her mind if she is a lesbian? 20. His fascination continues. 21. Albertine is a girl in a flat sports cap pushing her bicycle across the beach when Marcel first sees her. He keeps going back to this image. 22. Albertine has no family, profession, or prospects. She is soon installed in Marcel's house. There she has a separate bedroom. He emphasizes that she is nonetheless an obedient person. See above on Albertine as heavy slave. 23. Albertine's face is sweet and beautiful from the front, but from the side has a hook-nosed aspect that fills Marcel with horror. He would take her face in his hands and reposition it. 24. The state of Albertine that most pleases Marcel is Albertine asleep. 25. By falling asleep, she becomes a plant, he says. 26. Plants do not actually sleep, nor do they lie or even bluff. 
They do, however, expose their genitalia. 27. Sometimes in her sleep, Albertine throws off her kimono and lies naked. Sometimes then Marcel possesses her. Albertine appears not to wake up. 28. Marcel appears to think he is the master of such moments. 29. Perhaps he is. At this point, parenthetically, several observations could be made about the similarity between Albertine and Ophelia, Hamlet's Ophelia, starting from the sexual life of plants, which Proust and Shakespeare equally enjoy using as a language of female desire. Albertine, like Ophelia, embodies for her lover blooming girlhood, but also castration, casualty, threat, and pure obstacle. Albertine, like Ophelia, is condemned for a voracious sexual appetite whose expression is denied her. Ophelia takes sexual appetite into the river and drowns it amid water plants. Albertine distorts hers into the false consciousness of a sleep plant. In both scenarios, the man appears to be in control of the script, yet gets himself tangled up in the wiles of the woman. On the other hand, who is bluffing whom is hard to say. 30. Albertine's laugh has the color and smell of a geranium. 31. Marcel gives Albertine the idea that he intends to marry her, but he does not. She bores him. 32. Albertine's eyes are blue and saucy. Her hair is like crinkly black violets. 33. Albertine's behavior in Marcel's house is that of a domestic animal, which enters any door it finds open or comes to lie beside its master on his bed, making a place for itself. Marcel has to train Albertine not to come into his room until he rings for her. 34. Marcel gradually manages to separate Albertine from all her friends, whom he regards as evil influences. 35. Marcel never says the word lesbian to Albertine. He says, the kind of woman I object to. 36. Albertine denies she knows any such women. Marcel assumes she is lying. 37. At first, Albertine has no individuality. Indeed, Marcel cannot distinguish her from her girlfriends or remember their names or decide which to pursue. They form a freeze in his mind, pushing their bicycles across the beach with the blue waves breaking behind them. 38. This pictorial multiplicity of Albertine evolves gradually into a plastic and moral multiplicity. Albertine is not a solid object. She is unknowable. When Marcel brings his face close to hers to kiss, she is ten different Albertines in succession. 39. One night Albertine goes dancing with a girlfriend at the casino. 40. When questioned about this, she lies. 41. Albertine is not a natural liar. 42. Albertine lies so much and so badly that Marcel is drawn into the game. He lies, too. 43. Marcel's jealousy, impotence, and desire are all exasperated to their highest pitch by the game. 44. Who is bluffing whom is hard to say. See above on Hamlet. 45. Near the end of Volume 5, Albertine finally runs away, vanishing into the night and leaving the window open. Marcel fusses and fumes and writes her a letter, in which he claims that he had just decided to buy her a yacht and a Rolls Royce when she disappeared. Now he will have to cancel those orders. The yacht had a price tag of 27,000 francs, about $75,000, and was to be engraved at the prow with her favorite stanza of a poem by Mallarmé. 46. In the novel, Albertine's death in a riding accident on page 642 of volume 5 does not emancipate Marcel from jealousy. 
it removes only one of the innumerable Albertines he would have to forget. The jealous lover cannot rest until he is able to touch all the points in space and time ever occupied by the beloved. 47. There is no right or wrong in Proust, says Samuel Beckett, and I believe it. The bluffing, however, remains a gray area. 48. Let's return to the transposition theory. 49. On May 30th, 1914, French newspapers reported that Alfred Agostinelli, a student aviator, fell from his machine into the Mediterranean Sea near Antibes and was drowned. Agostinelli, you recall, was the chauffeur whom Proust, in letters to friends, admitted that he not only loved but adored. Proust had bought Alfred the airplane, which cost 27,000 francs, about $75,000, and had had it engraved on the fuselage with a stanza of Mallarmé. <laughs> Proust also paid for Alfred, Alfred's flying lessons and registered him at the flying school under the name Marcel Swan. The flying school was in Monaco. In order to spy on Alfred while he was there, Proust sent another favorite manservant, whose name was Albert. 50. Compare and contrast Albertine's sudden fictional death by runaway horse with Alfred Agostinelli's sudden real-life death by runaway plane. Poignantly, both unfortunate beloveds managed to speak to his or her lover from beyond the wild blue. Agostinelli, before setting out for his final flight, had written a long letter, which Proust was heartbroken to receive the day after the plane crash. Transposed to the novel, this exit scene becomes one of the weirdest in fiction. 51. Several weeks after accepting the news that Albertine has been thrown from her horse and killed, Marcel gets a telegram. You think me dead, but I'm alive and long to see you, affectionately, Albertine. Marcel agonizes for days about this news and debates with himself whether he could possibly resume relations with her, only to realize that the signature on the telegram has been misread by the telegraph operator. The telegram is not from Albertine at all, but from another long-lost girlfriend whose name, Gilbert, shares its central letters with Albertine's. 52. One only loves that which one does not entirely possess, says Marcel. 53. There are four ways Albertine is able to avoid becoming entirely possessed in Volume 5. By sleeping, by lying, by being a lesbian, and by being dead. <laughs> 54. Only the first three of these can she bluff. <laughs> 55. Proust was still correcting a typescript of La Prisonniere on his deathbed, November 1922. He was fine-tuning the character of Albertine and working into her speech certain phrases from Alfred Agostinelli's final letter. 56. It is always tricky, the question whether to read an author's work in light of his life or not. 57. Granted, the transposition theory is a graceless, intrusive, and saddening hermeneutic mechanism. In the case of Proust, it is also irresistible. Here is one final spark to be struck from rubbing Alfred against Albertine, as it were. Let's consider the stanza of poetry that Proust had inscribed on the fuselage of Alfred's plane, the same verse that Marcel promises to engrave on the prow of Albertine's yacht. From her favorite poem, he says, it is four verses of Mallarmé about a swan that finds itself frozen into the ice of a lake in winter. Swans are, of course, migratory birds. This one, for some reason, failed to fly off with its fellow swans when the time came. What a weird and lonely shadow to cast on these two love affairs, the fictional and the real. What a desperate analogy to offer of the lover's final wintry paranoia of possession. 
as Hamlet says to Ophelia, accurately but ruthlessly, you should not have believed me. 58. Here is the stanza of Mallarmé in English. A swan of olden times remembers that it is he, the one magnificent but without hope of setting himself free, for he failed to sing of a region for living when barren winter burned all round him with ennui. 59. Everything, indeed, is at least double. La Prisonnière, page 362. There ends the essay. In order to linger with Proust a moment more, I want to read to you three appendices of pertinent information. Appendix 32 on slavery. Marcel's use of the phrase heavy slave bothers me. A certain master-slave tonality in Marcel's relationships with other people overall bothers me. What makes a slave heavy? Does she have a heavy skin, heavy step, heavy jokes, heavy childhood? Does she come from a heavy nation or adhere to a heavy philosophy of life? Does she speak with a heavy accent? Does she have a heavy reason for doing everything you tell her? Does a heavy slave imply a light master? Let's say you want to get rid of your slave. Do you use a heavier weapon than you'd need for a master, or will any light to medium implement do? Say, a runaway horse or an early winter? How about bluffing the slave into thinking she's winning this game you play every day with the kimono and the trick questions? Do you have the stamina for that, and will you miss it when it ends? And how do all these bear upon the difference between metaphor and metonymy? Sorry this appendix got away on me. <coughs> appendix 33A, on the difference between metaphor and metonymy. Since this question has arisen, here's the difference. In a group of children asked to respond to the word hut, some said a small cabin, some said it burned down. <laughs> Appendix 33b on metaphor and metonymy. Now that I give it second thought, the difference between a small cabin and it burned down does not illuminate anything about metaphor and metonymy. It does, however, speak to the fragility of the adventure of thinking. The day I decided to figure out metaphor and metonymy once and for all, I went to the library, got an armful of books, read different parts of all of them, wrote some notes on scraps of paper, and came home, hoping to sort out the whole thing the following day. The following day, among my notes, which by then had become disorganized and unintelligible, I found this haunting and exemplary small cabin that may or may not have burned down. And although I couldn't remember its context, had neglected to record its provenance, and didn't really grasp its relevance for metaphor and metonymy, the small cabin called out to me not to forsake it. It remains a very good example. We just don't know of what. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Thank you, Anne. That was really amazing. I loved it. Um, so I just want to mention one thing. I'm going to stand on my toes for not very long, because I'll never be as tall as Anne, sadly. Um, OK, so a lot of people are asking me about um, T2 and the 28-acre reserve. And so I, I want to just invite all of you now um, we hope you'll join us on July 2nd for our next event, which is the opening of our 28-acre sculpture reserve and the opening of the T2 gallery um, and the X of in-house. The new T2 gallery will serve as an orientation pavilion for the reserve, uh, which is a natural landscape extension 
of the programs of T-Space. And nearby, the new experimental X of in-house will serve as quarters for artists and residents in the future. And we're very excited about our expansion plans and look forward to sharing it with you. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Thank you.